Hey, let's uh, let's get going. Um, so yeah, Simon, thanks for the introduction and and also for the invite. Um, pleased to be able to have a have a slot. Hopefully, share some um, insights and some techniques that I hope will be useful for people. Obviously, I don't know you all, so uh, and we're all different as we'll talk about later. So my invitation is to be open-minded, just to be thinking as we go through the session. Could this be useful for me? in what I do and how I do it in my trading, take on board what might be useful, go away, give it a try and have a play with it. If it's not for you, that's fine too, park it to one side. Uh, if you get any questions that aren't answered, feel free to ask at the Q&A at the end or beyond the session uh, via email. So um, just, a, I guess, a very quick intro to myself. So I've been working with, with traders uh, and fund managers uh, since February 2005, so just over 15 years now. I specialize in uh, what we would call performance coaching, so largely a combination of psychology and physiology, so the mind and the body. So if you think about when you're trading, um, you have the craft of trading, the skill set, the knowledge set, and let's wrap into that the strategy, the process for now. And how you're doing that moment to moment, so how well you do your trading craft is not just about the craft as you all know in a, in a moment of executing a trade or or when you're faced with taking a loss um or recovering from a loss whatever it might be holding on to a, a winning trade the craft is kind of the, the almost like the behavior level kind of the action you need to take but how well you do that is very dependent on what's going on in the mind and the body and uh, early in your trading careers as most of you will have probably been doing uh you tr work really hard at developing the craft because you need that but as you progress through trading, what you realize actually is that the mind and body play an increasing part. And so my role with my clients who are largely hedge funds, uh, investment banks, commodities trading houses, asset managers, uh, utilities companies and prop trading groups. Uh, so professional traders across the globe. My role is the trader comes with um, with a skill set, with, 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 with the craft as such. And what I try and do is help them to train and become more skilled at the mind and the body. So we have to appreciate that, you know, the very best traders that I've encountered and that I work with are skilled at the craft, the mind and the body. But also I think it's really important to recognize they are training the craft, the mind and the body. So it's not, uh, it's not by chance. So you know, as we're going through this, we've got quite a narrow focus today, but just be thinking to yourself, you know, about your own development and just think about, you know, how much time am I spending training the craft? and how much time am I spending training my mind and the body? And as you become more experienced, the mind and the body will become a bigger piece. So um, I've also done a lot of work before trading. I worked as a, a sports psychology coach for a few years, um, athletes and teams all over the world, 33 different sports. And I've also had the opportunity to work as a, uh, a psychological coach actually with, with professional poker players. So um, generally my passion is kind of you know, risk-taking, decision-making, and, and performance, they're my three kind of real key passions. So I wanna share a bit with it, of that with you today. We haven't got a lot of time, so um, I've tried to go pretty narrow. We've called it um, Becoming a Bulletproof Trader, um, and that is that is key. It's obviously a nice little link to the book as well. Um, but um, it's really about how do we deal with the downside of trading? Because one thing I've noticed in my 15 years of working with traders and fund managers is um, the, you know when, when you're making money, um, generally it feels good, people are happy. I mean, it's quite high risk actually making money. A lot of money is lost when people are doing well because we can get overconfident. Um, but it becomes really difficult for people often when they're having, you know, taking a loss, taking a bigger loss, you know, a, a run of losses, a period of drawdown can be really challenging. And so, you know, and I've seen that in 15 years and I think, you know, the markets have got pretty competitive. Uh, certainly for institutional traders, there's been some challenging things around regulation and restructuring and redundancy. So it's been a pretty tough, few years. So I want to just kind of um, provide some support for that for people. And that's what I want to do today. And we're going to dial it in even um, to a, a narrower focus because we're going to look specifically at kind of dealing with losses. And uh, that'll be our main focus. So, so the, th the first thing to really recognize is, uh, and when I speak to my trading clients, I'll often say to them, kind of, you know, how are things or how things going? And uh, the most popular answer that I'll, I'll, I get from traders is ups and downs. And if you think back, you know, to your own trading, you know, if I said to you, how's it been going? Perhaps you would also say ups and downs. And, and maybe that's trading is ups and downs. And maybe that's the nature 
of the game. There are ups and there are downs, and there can be big ups and big downs. This can be the challenges of the intensity of the ups, and the downs can be can be high. So the goal really is, you know, we want to as if we look at the mind and the body, this is where it becomes really important. We want the mind and body to be able to um, to manage uh, and to become more tolerant to the highs and the lows. And uh, what I've put on the screen, now, I can't go through it in detail. You can read for yourself, really. But it's just I want you to be aware that when you're on a winning run or when you're on a, a high versus maybe on your, a losing run and you're on a low, there are changes going on within you that are um, psychological and that are biological, physiological and neurological. So the mind and the body are changing in response to whether you're making money or losing money. And it's happening whether you like it or not. And it's happening largely outside your conscious awareness. And that changing of your state can play a factor in your subsequent decision making. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be able to manage it. And we also need to accept that it happens. You can't get rid of it. You can't turn it off. Um, the skill is learning to get good at it. And that's really important. You know, it. Um, we. If we, I guess, go into the downside, we look at losing, you know, it, it's, it's the old cliche and we all hear it and we know it conceptually, you know, losing um, is a part of trading. So, you know, if you, if you want to avoid losing, the simple solution is, is to not place any trades. Um, it's just unfortunate that it will stop you from making any money. So, but that is the choice. So if you want to engage in the activity, which is largely probabilistic, there will be negative outcomes and you'll need to be able to manage those. Um, but it's easy to understand that conceptually. So, you know, often I see uh, posted on social media, you'll probably have seen this yourself, is the Michael Jordan quote, where he talks about, you know, he's had so many shots, X thousand of shots, so many game winning shots, and he's missed so many. And, you know, that, that's besides, you know, he's, he's had so many shots and misses. That's why he's a winner. That's the basic crux of it. And it's a great example of how um, conceptually uh, at maybe the mindset level we can go, yeah, do you know what? That's true. I need to have a mindset that's good, you know, dealing with losses and I need to be able to think about, you know, a mistake as a learning opportunity. And, I, and I'll talk about that later. It is important. But think about a time when you took a big loss. Um, did you immediately kind of come in with this very philosophical, um, very logical, rational explanation for it? Or were you initially flooded with some um, challenging thoughts and emotions that showed up? And for most of us, probably the latter. That's the human condition. We've got to be able to deal with that. Um, so losing hurts. That's what I say to people. Losing does hurt. And actually, if you care about your trading and you care about what you're doing, then it, it probably hurts a little bit more. And if you're trying to get really good and make progress and you lose and you have setbacks, perfectly normal that, that it might be a bit painful. Uh, and it's not the pain that's the problem. The pain is, is perfectly normal. It's how we deal with the pain. Um, which is really key. So that's what I want to kind of touch on. So, uh, you know, we know that loss aversion, people don't like losing. We know there's something called the disposition effect, which is basically that people become um, risk averse in situations of gain and uh, risk um, seeking in situations of, of, of loss. Uh, we know that ego can play a part in this. You know, ego really in simple terms is about looking good uh, and being right. And uh, taking a loss for many people um, does not always sit well with looking good or, or with being right. So, you know, ego is a part. And actually, if you go biological, then when you're losing money, you know, you're essentially in a threat situation and the stress response activates. And what the stress response does, if it's high enough, is it will make your focus um, shift to basically what do I need to do in the short term to survive? So it's really about avoiding pain or seeking immediate pleasure, kind of the long term focus required to kind of stay in a in a trade or to get out of the trade correctly. Um, disappears um, as a biology shift. So a lot of factors are going on when we are um, approaching a loss, when we are trying to take a loss, and also when we're trying to recover from that loss. So um, we want to be able to kind of manage that as well as we can. We can't, again, we can't undo all this. This is what I want to really make clear. So we can't undo it all. It's a skill set to get good at it. Um, I also want us just to quickly recognize that we're all different. So I'm going to try and talk you through a range of different tools and techniques that I use with my own clients. Um, I don't have a formula, so I don't use the same tools with all people. And so I'm not saying this will apply for all of you. So you've got to be willing to um, know yourself. So this is just very quickly on the screen. It's just a psychometric test that I use with my own clients and measures um, 
people's dispositions towards risk and uncertainty and how they deal with um, negative consequences. So it's pretty useful for, for us trading folk. And what we know, or what I know, because I've done hundreds of these, if not into the thousands now with, with clients, is that um, all traders are different. So traders that are kind of that are higher up in that um, wheel as such um, are the ones who are a bit more risk averse. And if you're lower down, you're a bit more risk seeking. If you're to the left, you're probably a little bit more intuitive and spontaneous. If you're to the right, you may be a bit more deliberate and maybe a bit more process driven. So we're all going to be different and we're all going to react differently to thinking about a loss, to taking a loss. We're all going to respond differently to how we manage losses once we've got them. So you've got to find your own way. Um, you know, the strategies that you trade can help you to mitigate the impact of losses. The risk that you take can help you to mitigate some of the, the impact of, of losing, as, as we'll touch on shortly, uh, as can your mindset and, and your kind of your mental framework, which again, we'll, we'll touch on. So there's a lot of factors that influence uh, the impact that a loss has on you, um, pre, during, and post. So you've got to keep thinking all the time, developing your own awareness and trying things out and finding an approach that's most effective for you. And the, the, the goal for all of us, irrespective of who we are, what we do, how we do it, where we do it, is to get good at the, da get good at the downs. Um, I think this is really, really key. You know, often people are asking me, what do I think are the qualities of a, of, a, of a great trader? I don't think there's a formula. Again, I think it's quite individual. I've got some traders who are doing very well, who are the opposites of other traders I work with who are doing very well. So there's a, a lot of individual difference, but I do believe that this ability uh, to be able to manage the downs is key. And um, the, the, the reason why I use the word bulletproof, actually, is I was doing some work with a, a very, very, very successful hedge fund trader, um, probably four or five years ago now. And he'd had a, a, a run of almost 15 years of, of being highly profitable. So very, very successful, very consistent, but had wanted or was aware that there were improvements to be made in his kind of day-to-day -day management of the ups and downs of trading, but was really preparing himself for, you know, if I go into a significant period of loss or drawdown, will I have the skills to cope? And he wanted to make sure he had those in place should it happen. So in anticipation, which is pretty um, good example of thinking differently, not waiting till it's happened and then trying to be reactive, but being proactive. And then he said, basically, I want you to help me to become bulletproof, Steve. So that's where that kind of I got that phrase from. I quite liked it. Um, but um, there's a, a stoic quote, uh, philosophy quote from Epictetus. And he says, um, life is hard, brutal, punishing, narrow, confusing, a deadly business. And I think you could put trading in front of that, you know, change life for trading. Lots of the stoic quotes, which I've got quite a big interest in. Um, if you just change the word life for trading, it. it they fit very nicely so uh, but again so what do we need to do we need to be prepared for that we need to build the skills to be able to manage the highs and the lows we know they're going to come it's a part of the experience the only question is are you preparing yourself to be ready my goal with my clients particularly the ones i'm working with who maybe earlier in their careers and my my goal to offer perhaps for you to be thinking about is to get to the stage where you can say confidently with an evidence base so this is not about a motivational affirmation which will serve you good for about two seconds until you realize that you can't do it and then you go into a, a stress response but to be able to confidently say i can deal with losses and setbacks part of that is experiential you've been through it you've had them you've coped with them you've recovered um and the other part is knowing you've got the skills to cope and that's what i want us to really kind of get into today is developing the skills to cope um, I want to talk about this in three stages. I want to, first of all, just touch a little bit on the idea of reduction. So the goal is to be able to deal with losses and setbacks. But part of that process is we don't want to really lose any more money than we ordinarily have to. And we don't want to get into setbacks, which are so deep and uncomfortable if we don't have to. So we can't avoid losing and we can't avoid setbacks, but we can certainly reduce uh, our exposure to them. Um, or to the, the magnitude of them. And there's three key factors. I mean, there's many, but I want to focus on three just because of time. 
that I think are useful to be thinking about because all of these can be actioned and trained. So these are not kind of um, philosophical as such. These are very much uh, pragmatics. So I want to talk first of all about mindset. And the, the Stoics talked about um, the inner citadel, which is basically like an internal mental fortress. And I, and I love the idea of us building this kind of mental fortress that kind of enables us to weather the storms which the market brings towards us. And, and I like the idea of the fortress because A, it kind of feels quite robust. So it's kind of like a nice image to have. I like the idea also that you could be adding bricks into the fortress. So you, you could be building skills and, and adding those bricks in, uh, which is really key. Now, your mindset really for me is, is it's largely, it's like a mental framework. It's how you think about trading. It's how you think about the markets. And it's also how you think about yourself and yourself as a trader. And that mental framework, which is really a bit about how you think, it's your beliefs, it's your perceptions, it's, it's um, your sense of purpose, it's mission, it's values. All of that is like a big filtering system for your experience. So when you experience a loss, the mental framework which you take into that loss um, has a huge impact on how you think, feel, um, behave and, and perform as a result of it. If we get into the thinking piece, then what what can we do? The first thing to recognize is, and, and I love this quote, this is one of the first things I read, certainly very early on in my, in my trading psychology career from Mark Douglas in Trading the Zone was that the best traders think differently from the rest. And that I can tell you now, that's true in all high performance. So you can you can change trading for poker, you can change poker for sports, you could change it for entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship, you can change it for business. And thinking differently is a key high performance skill. What does it mean when we get into, into trading? Well, there's a lot of things that if you think about things in one way, you're going to get a different response to if you think about it in a different way. So for example, if you are overly focused on the outcomes of your trades, whether you're winning or losing, you will get a different response in the body, in the mind, to if you are focused more on the process and how well you are trading. If you see losses as negatives, as things to be avoided, um, and a sign that you are, you know, that you failed, then you will have a different response to if you see losses as a learning opportunity. If you think about things in terms of probabilities and are open to the idea that trades can lose, then you will get a different response to if you think about having trade should be perfect and no trade should lose. Um, if you think about uh, making money and that's the goal in trading versus if you think about the goal of making progress and becoming a better trader, then you will get different responses. So your perceptions and how you think about um, trading and risk and uncertainty and the markets and yourself will all impact the experience you have. So it's quite interesting as a process to go through is to think to yourself, OK, well, what is my mental framework? What how do I think when I'm trading? What am I focusing on? Um, how do I think about losses? What's my mindset about drawdown? What's my mindset? How do I think about uncertainty? What meaning do I give these? And then, you know, are these useful for me or not? And if not, what might be a more useful way of thinking? And it is really, it's about utility. You know, a thought is purely a thought. Um, it really only has value when you look at it in terms of context. Is it helpful for me or not in this situation? And if those thoughts aren't helpful, then, you know, A, recognize it's not helpful. That's the first step, get some distance, really powerful. Secondly, what might be a more useful thought can be really powerful. So, you know, just take some time to be, bring awareness to you, maybe keep a thought journal or, or any kind of journal, but record your thinking and start to look for insights into what your mental framework is and how that is either helping or get in the way of you when it comes to dealing with losses. Because this is what we, we can front load this. We can choose to think about things in specific ways that can reduce the impact when we get into those moments. Also think about where you're focused. Uh, and for me, the, and I had this conversation, I was doing a coaching session earlier with a client today. And again, it came through that it was very, very strongly outcome results, PL focused, this conversation. And it was causing big shifts to mental, emotional and physical state. So my goal then is to try and bring the client back into. You will make the most money trading in context of the current conditions when you're making the best trading decisions. So the, the paradox is we need to let go a little bit of outcome 
and really get into the process. The steps that you specifically take, how you identify trades, trading ideas, how you put your portfolio together, how you get into the trades, how you manage trades, how you get out of them. All of this is your unique way of doing things. It's your process. And you need to really work on that because what we know about when activities are probabilistic, like trading and investing are, then you know the correlation between the, um, the decision as such and the outcome is the causality is, is not that strong. You know, you all know this, and this is why I put this little table on the screen there. You know, you can do the right things, do good pro process. That trade might win, but that trade might also lose, but you did the right things. Um, it's really about, you know, it's the replication of it over time when you really start to see um, if your strategy has an edge or not. But likewise, you could do all the wrong things and the trade could win or the trade could lose. So, um, but those quadrant four trades, you know, they're not, they're not good experiences. Now, what, what I would say, again, this is a mindset shift. If you get a quadrant two trade, for me, that's a losing trade because you did all the right things as far as you know the right things and you lost. So um, it's a bad break. Yeah. And in, in, in poker, interestingly, where there's very high variance, you get a lot of those quadrant two outcomes. If you get a quadrant four trade, for me, that's a bad trade. You did the wrong things and you lost. So that's a bad trade. In fact, I would say a quadrant three is also a bad trade. So you could start to think about things in terms of, you know, there could be a losing trade, did all the right things and I lost, or I could have a bad trade where I did I where I did the wrong things and, and, and I lost, but also perhaps um, even winning from a, a bad trade, bad process would be a bad outcome. So um, that's an important shift, but really see if you can get into this idea about the goal on the trade is to trade well, you know, to make good decisions. And the goal in the long term as trading is to get better at making good trading decisions. Now you're into a mastery approach and that goes a long way to offset ego and some of the other challenges that we face um, in our trading. And then the final fact I want to quickly touch on in terms of prevention is just risk. And again, I had this, this conversation again earlier today. It's amazing how often these conversations, the same themes come up, which is just recognizing that in any given moment, so in any given market that you're trading, based on the current context of the market, so the volatility could be one context factor, uh, what you're trying to achieve, your level of skill and ability and so on, all of these kind of factors, they're going to influence what might be the most effective um, position size to take. Because if you trade too small, um, and this was happening to my client earlier, he was he was losing for him, small sums of money, probably for most of us, it'd be relatively large, uh, but he was losing small sums of money because the risk he was taking was too small and he wasn't, he didn't care enough about the outcome and he wasn't focused enough on the execution. So he was, he was in his word, careless. And um, that's what happens when the risk is too small. Most of you will have encountered when you're on the far side, on the right hand side, when now the risk is too big. And now, you know, we get a bit of movement in the price action. We start to panic. Either it goes on side, you know, we go, it goes in our favor. We get a burst of excitement and adrenaline. Uh, maybe the urge to take the profits early or it goes against us and we get the sick feeling in the stomach and we might panic um, and not get out of the trade when we should. So in the middle is this sweet spot. Uh, I often call it optimal risk or, or think about it much more like a, a window of tolerance. I, you know, there's a range, a lower and a higher number where inside that window, you feel pretty comfortable. And the goal essentially is to balance um, opportunity maximization. So within the current context of the market and within the context of your strategy, how do we balance the opportunity that's presented to us and maximizing that with also executing the trade effectively. And if the trade size is too small or too large, it can lead to, for, for people, um, a reduction in the execution factor. So that's, that's the kind of the balancing act to be thinking about. But just be wary, particularly, of going too far to the right, trading too big. And if you are consistently getting anxiety and stress and worry in your trading, um, then a simple check is, am I simply trading too big? What would happen if I reduce my position sizes slightly um, and test it out and see if it makes a difference? Um, but that's a really, really important one because it's not just how much you lose on that trade. If you take a big position and you end up with a big loss, it's not just the loss in that moment, it's all the time it takes to recover, which is important. So there's some prevention work to do. There's things up front you can do which can reduce 
And that work should be done first, because if you're not doing that, then you're just opening yourself up to a whole kind of worms psychologically, emotionally, um, and, uh, and mentally when you do take these big losses. So we want to try and reduce and remove where possible. The next skill is really about what do I do when I'm in a position and my strategy says that I should be taking this, you know, taking this loss, um, but I don't want to for whatever reason. You know, maybe some thoughts are showing up. Um, I need this trade to win. I can't afford to take this loss. What if the market comes back? Maybe some emotions show up, some anxiety, some fear, some worry, some stress. Maybe the sensations show up in the body. And then you don't take the losing trade when you should do. And maybe sometimes it does come back. And maybe other times it doesn't and you end up with huge losses. So, um, But the skill for me really, you know, in simple terms, is if you want to be disciplined as a trader, you need to have the skill of what I call committed action, which means you are able to execute your trading strategy even in the presence of a challenging thought, emotion or sensations in the body. And there are three skills to being able to do this. So, you know, this is really we, we might call this the three skills of disciplined trading in very simple terms it, in light of the fact that if we and I'll touch on this later in more detail, but if we don't learn to take action when it is difficult and we always go for the easy choice, the easy choice more often than not will reduce your market returns. That's your payoff. It's uncomfortable, but more profitable. Uh, and I'm doing this work with a, with a successful hedge fund manager at the moment, you know, to try and improve his game further is um, being more uncomfortable to increase profitability. There's a payoff between comfort and profits. Uh, and useful to think to yourself, what am I doing when I'm trading? You know, I'm, when I'm making a decision, uh, am I choosing the comfortable choice, doing the uh, the easy thing versus or am I doing the hard thing, but probably the one that's going to maximize gains in the long run? So the three skills are these. The first skill is action focus. So nobody's ever lost money to date. And uh, or I would contest down to an emotion. So an emotion does not make you lose money. You lose money when you um, pull the trigger. So when you take an action um, which causes you to, to lose money. So all trading losses, unless you're doing it through an hour, that, that is different. But at the human level, all of your losses are down to you, down to action. Your emotions and your thoughts may influence that in some way for sure. But it's an action at the core. So the first thing to be aware of that's really important if you want to be good at taking losses is you need to know the action you're going to take. So it might be, you know, it could be a simple. I've got my stop loss level when it gets to there. This level could be a technical level, could be just a, a zone, whatever your style is, doesn't matter. But you need to know that there's some point where you're going to take an, an, an action and what that action is. So you need to know what action to take. If you don't know what action to take, then you don't know what to do. Um, so there has to be an action. That's the process piece. Then it's about this. It's about noticing, being aware of what might show up that's going to stop you from taking the action you know you should be taking. And this is typically going to be, for most of us, a thought, an emotion or a sensation, probably a combination of them. So how do I develop that awareness? You can start off by noticing it in real time if that's helpful. The skill that I teach people, particularly um, as a training technique, if we talk about training the mind, for me, this is where things like mindfulness, meditation, even breath work practice, this is where we start to learn the skills of awareness. So if you're not doing a mindfulness meditation um, type practice or a breath work type practice, then potentially, <clears throat> excuse me, you're missing out on an opportunity to develop the awareness that's required to be able to manage yourself because you can't manage a thought or an emotion if you're not even aware of it in the first place. So there's an action you're trying to take. That's the focus. Then you're aware of what's kind of going on externally and internally. So external market context, internally thoughts, feelings, sensations. And even just by being able to notice if you've got this awareness and there's a great quote in Market Wizards. Tom Basso, the hedge fund manager, talks about how when he's trading really well, it's like there's a Tom Basso in the corner of the room watching the Tom Basso at the trading screen, uh, like the observer perspective. And I hear that a lot from my clients that I work with that when they're trading really well, it's not a disconnection, 
but it is like a, an observer perspective, but you can train that. Now, when you're in the observer perspective, we're aware and we're noticing but we're not reactive. We've got a little bit of flexibility and choice from that perspective, which is really, really critical. Because if you are, you know, if, if you're in the river as such of experience, you go where the river takes you. If you're above the river, noticing the river, you can make choices. So being aware of your thoughts and feelings. Now, if you are in the moment and you become aware of a thought you're having or an emotion, best thing you can do, don't try not to feel it, don't ignore it, acknowledge it. I notice I'm thinking, I need this trade to win. I'm noticing a feeling of anxiety. As soon as you notice what's happening in that moment, you reduce the reactivity and you increase a little bit of distance and that allows you to be more responsive. It's a really key skill, but that, that skill can be practiced in the moment as described. You can build the capacity to do that better and more effectively and actually train the brain neurologically through mindfulness, meditation, breathwork type practices. So there's some options there for you. You notice a thought, I need this trade to win. You become aware of an anxiety that you might lose money. And typically we frame those as negative and people try to avoid them. Now, this leads into this dilemma. This can be at the crux of quite a few of our trading challenges, which is the choice between short term avoidance in the name of comfort at the expense of long term gains. and you know, think about it in your own trading times when you have made a choice, not taking a loss, so and not taking a loss in the moment keeps you comfortable. You're not exposed to um, the thoughts, emotions and feelings that might come and sensations that might come with that loss. Um, so you stay in the trade and hopefully you, you probably are hoping it comes back, but it may not. Um, and probably over time, you end up losing more money than you make from that strategy. So there's long term consequences. This is true, not just for losses, but also ambiguity, regret, which is a really powerful emotion, you know, being wrong, making mistakes, um, all of these factors. And what's the alternative? The alternative is we have to be willing to accept the short term discomfort and to do what is the right thing to do to follow your process um, in context of what the market is doing and your strategy. Um, versus feeling good. Feeling good is really, you know, it's the emotions of the emotional parts of the brain. It's avoid pain, get pleasure. Uh, you know, taking profits too early is a feel good thing. You know, we, we feel good in the short term, not taking the loss. That's the short term feel good. And, and again, this is why, you know, when we've got big risk on with the stress response is higher. And when we're highly stressed, it pushes us into this kind of feel good mandate. So we want to be keeping our risk in that window of tolerance so we can stay in the do the right thing. Um, mandate and but the one thing I'd, you know, I'd really say to you is, is is accept that trading is going to be uncomfortable you know losing money isn't comfortable being wrong it isn't comfortable uh, taking a loss might not be comfortable holding a winning trade isn't comfortable um, and I can tell you from having worked with thousands of traders all over the world of all different levels of abilities that even the most successful traders I've worked with find these situations uncomfortable but they've just learned over the years how to reduce that discomfort. That's the goal. The goal is to get good at discomfort, is to get good at the, the downs. It's not about removing them. You can't, but you can get good at dealing with them. And a very simple way, just be thinking the next time you're in a trade and you've got a choice of maybe not taking that loss, just check in. Am I not taking the loss because it's strategic, i.e. something's changed in the market and there's a, a reason for not taking the loss right now? Or am I not taking it because the goal is to feel good. I just want to avoid the pain of losing. And it can give you that little extra nudge to maybe take the trade, uh, take the loss when you should do. Um, be aware of the thoughts as they come along. Be aware of the emotions in the body. So, you know, have that awareness and be willing to accept them when they're uncomfortable. And now we can be aware of the thoughts and emotions. We're willing to accept that they're uncomfortable. And at the same time, we keep our focus on taking the effective action, which is easier with the level of awareness. So that's kind of the, and again, it's a quick explanation, but that's kind of the process mentally that I try and get my, my clients into. And it often makes a huge difference for them in, in many areas of their trading. And, you know, then we, we, we take a loss and maybe we take several losses. Maybe we take multiple losses over a long period of time. And I've had traders who've had very long losing runs. Um, and it is difficult. It is very challenging. And so what do we do? Well, 
let's look at it in two time frames. There's one situation where you take a loss and obviously now you want to recover from that loss. And there's a situation where we're in, we're in kind of multiple losses. So, you know, a losing run or a period of drawdown. Here's my first piece of, of um, I guess, guidance is this, is just check in with your state, with your physiological state. So if your heart is racing, if your muscles are tight, if your breathing's, you know, really fast, short and shallow, you are now in a very heightened state. And the danger here is that when we're in these high level physiological states is that our cognition, our kind of our thinking functionality closes down. Short term emotion reactivity takes over. And that's partly behind and we're back into the market, revenge trading and so on, which obviously most of us would not want to be doing. So if you feel you're in a high level heightened state physiologically, the first thing you need to do is change the physiology because you can't assess the trade. You can't make a good decision if your cognitive function is reduced. So a lot of people, you know, they, they, they lose money or they're in a losing run. They try and talk the way or think the way out of it. But you can't do that if you're in a high level stress state, because in a high level stress state, your thinking capability is reduced and it can be quite extreme if it's a high level state. So just check in. How's my state? It could be easy. 10, super ramped up. One is kind of, you know, completely, you know, almost uh, asleep, um, super calm. Where am I? If you're in the 10, nine zone, the, f the best thing to do, take a break, go for a walk, take some slow, deep breaths. It could be for a few moments. It could be for a few minutes. It might be for a few hours. It might be for a day or two. Do whatever you need to do to allow the system to reset. If you watch animals in the wild when they're chased and hunted, for example, what you'll see is there'll be the hunt. One of the animal will also will be killed. The rest of the herd will, will basically um, graze not too far away from the kill because they know they're safe after, the, after the, the predators had its kill. And you'll see them shaking quite often. And that's the body resetting from the stress state back to homeostasis. And that's what we want to do as traders. We want to have this stress response, perfectly normal. You've lost money, uh, perfectly normal to be frustrated or, and maybe even angry. Um, all these things might show up, but if it's high, just regulate it. Um, breathing is very effective for that. Breath work strategy is very, very effective. Now we can deal with, once we've kind of reset and we feel ready again, and we shouldn't do any trading until we are ready, now we can get into the psychology. So this isn't really um, an order here, but here are a few of the techniques that I would encourage that you could have a play around with. So when you've just taken a loss or you're in a losing run, Lots of thoughts can crop into your mind. And, and when I was writing the book, I was, I was doing some work with a big hedge fund and a few of the guys were giving me some input for the book, which was great. And one of the, the, the uh, fund managers who's very successful was talking about how you know, he'd had a, a losing period. And even though he knew that it was going to be temporary, you know, and that, you know, he would get his mojo back as such. And he, he'd had a very good track record and his job wasn't at risk. He still couldn't get this kind of thought out of his mind that, you know, that he wasn't good enough and that he should be doing better. So even though logically he knew that, you know, it, it was going to be OK. This thought about not being good enough and these doubts and anxiety still get, kept cropping up. And that's true for many people. And you can spend a lot of time trying to get rid of them or not have them. And, 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 and you know, and if that works for you, then that's great. But for a lot of people, they just keep coming back. So this is what I call unhooking. It's about noticing the thought, I'm not good enough. I notice the thought, I'm not good enough. And I, un I unhook by shifting it to, I'm noticing, I'm having the thought that I'm not good enough. So I'm noticing, I'm having a thought that I'm not good enough. Think about a thought you have, which is unhelpful. Shift it from the thought to, I'm noticing, I'm having the thought that. And then see how it feels. And it just allows us to have the thought is popped in. We can't stop that. The trains come into the station. What do we do? We just unhook so we don't get caught up in the thinking. This is the power. You're going to get some emotions that show up. And this is true for an extended run as it is for, a, for a, you know, when you take the loss, um, a singular loss as such. Again, be aware of the emotion. It's called naming and taming. A guy called Matt Lieberman at UCLA, neuroscientist. So, when you have an emotion, if you are able to notice the emotion and to give it a name, it's called affect labeling, then actually it reduces the intensity of the emotion. So don't try not to feel it. Not feeling the emotion is like taking a beach ball and holding it underwater. Hard, takes effort, and it can pop up. 
and, and obviously it can you know come back with, with power. So just notice, oh, I'm noticing I'm feeling angry or I'm noticing I'm feeling really frustrated about what's happened. And then maybe the next layer is, and why? Well, I'm noticing I'm feeling really angry about what happened because I took too much risk or because I wasn't patient with my entry or whatever it might be. But if you can think about, you know, the emotion and notice it and name it and then maybe think about, you know, well, why am I feeling that? That can be really powerful. You might notice that you're, we can judge ourselves and I can't even say in this live session some examples of some of the really bad stuff I've heard from traders who have told me about what they say to themselves when they've made a mistake or lost money or in a losing run. Horrific, horrific. Um, so we can be very hard on ourselves. We can judge ourselves quite harshly when we don't get a good outcome. So, so if that's true for you, just be aware of that pattern and just try and soften it slightly by acknowledging the critical part that's coming through because the attention is good probably but it may not be helpful in the context. And just see if you can shift that perspective to, you know, what would a good trading coach be saying to me in this situation? Or what would I be saying if I was coaching somebody else in the same situation? That can be really useful for just kind of um, shifting um, some of the intensity in our own language. Um, look for what has worked. So, you know, when a trade loses, um, for sure, you've, it's lost and you've had a, you know, a negative outcome. But it might be that you've got a great entry you, you know, you picked a great position size, maybe you held the trade well, so that there could be, you know, and this is why I think about, you know, trades are a bit like a car. When, when a car breaks down, it's very rare, unless you've got a really bad car, that the whole car's failed, it'll be a component piece. So when you have a losing trade, um, it's easy to go, oh, that trade lost, you know, I lost money, and we generalize about it, and that makes it really intense, actually. Whereas we go, okay, the outcome was negative, we lost money, but when we look at the whole trade process, look at, well, what went well in that trade process? What did I do well such that we don't overgeneralize it which, and make it too pervasive? Um, so, you know, and it might be that you did five things really well and maybe you just got the exit wrong or got the sizing wrong. Um, so be mindful of appreciating what's worked because that can be really helpful. Likewise, once you've taken the loss or during a period of, of, of losing, um, what's the opportunity here? is really important. Um, can I turn the adversity into advantage, which is a kind of, again, a real key part of the stoic philosophy. Um, it's really important. When, when I'm working with clients, I often think about, you know, when, when you're in a, in a losing run over time, or the markets are quieter, and we're maybe not earning as much as we would like to, that's a great opportunity for learning. Because you know, most traders, when they're making money and, and the markets are good, um, they're content with the fact that market conditions are conducive, they're making money, they're happy, and they just want to kind of, they, they basically they're hoping it carries on. That's most traders' mindset. So when do we really get the chance to stop, pause, learn, grow, develop, try new things? It's often only actually when things are not going so well. So, you know, think about, you know, there are some cycles in trading where it's like an earning cycle. Markets are good, you're trading well, profit maximization. Maybe markets are not as conducive or you're not trading as well. You're losing money or not making money. And that might be the learning cycle. What can I, what could be good about this? Uh, what could I gain? How could I benefit? How could this make me a better trader? One thing it will always do is when things are not going well, the opportunity for all of us during tough times is to practice the skills of dealing with tough times. That's how you get good at it. You can read about and you can learn about as we're doing today, the skills, the techniques of dealing with losses and dealing with losing runs, but you don't get good at it through that. You get good at it when you get to practice it. So, you know, when you're taking a losing trade, see it as an opportunity to practice being good at losing trades when you're in a period of drawdown or, or a losing run. See that as an opportunity to practice the skills of dealing with it psychologically. And then what happens physiologically is when you get exposed to a stressor, your body providing you give it enough recovery, will adapt itself so that it can then, in the future, deal with that level of stress again and a bit more. It's called a process of supercompensation or overcompensation. So physiologically and psychologically, we can become more resilient through exposure to losses and setbacks. And this is why 
if we play the game of always seeking comfort and we avoid losing and we avoid losing runs and we avoid all the things that are uncomfortable in trading, we can never learn the skills and practice them to get good at them. So that's really key. And then the action piece really is just, you know, it's about thinking, you know, when I've had a losing trade, what are the behaviors I want to put in place to deal with that? And it might be, you know, that I manage my physiology, I might introduce some unhooking, and there might be some reflection and reviewing and so on. Uh, what's the action I want to be taking during a period of drawdown or losing run? What do I want to be doing? And maybe how do I want to be being during that period is really important. So the focus is really about, you know, managing losses. Um, three key elements to that. Can we get some front loading to reduce the impact by developing um, an effective mental framework? Can we be more focused on the process and making good decisions? And can we look to optimize risk in the sweet spot, be in our window of tolerance more? So not knowingly take ourselves into the levels where it's uncomfortable. It's a starting point. When we're taking losses, be aware of what does my process say? What is my step for success that I should be taking in this moment? That's the action piece. As best as you can, be aware of what's going on internally, thinking, feeling, sensations in the body. Be aware of them and be open to them. There's no need to get rid of them. If they appear to be difficult thoughts or emotions, that's fine. Be open to them as well. There's no need to get rid of them. The way around loss aversion is to move to loss acceptance. The way we get around regret aversion is we move to regret acceptance. The way we get away from ambiguity aversion is we move to ambiguity acceptance. So we have to be willing, and this is the key thing, we have to be willing to take the discomfort that comes with some of these difficult trading decisions. And the willingness is really, really important. Yeah, we need to be willing to accept the fact that we may have to take trading action whilst at the same time it coexisting with a challenging thought, emotion or sensation. And then recovery, we talked about a few techniques there, unhooking emotions, coaching ourselves, positives, opportunity, action. Again, I'm not saying you do all six, but there's a menu there of techniques and you might find that some of those are valuable for you more so than others. Simon kindly mentioned um, at the beginning um, the new book, which is out, Bulletproof Trader, just a week old. Um, Harriman House of the Publishers, they're doing um, at the moment a special discount. So you can get it 25% discount and, and free postage and packing, which is pretty cool uh, if you order it from the Harriman House website. If you're not inside the UK, you can only get the ebook. Um, but if you're in the UK, you can get ebook or hard copy. And um, that's that. If you've got any questions, we'll do a bit of Q&A in a moment. I think we've got a few minutes left for Q&A. But if any questions go unanswered or you've got any questions that pop into your mind in the next few days, then my details are there. Feel free to, um, to drop me an email. So I'm going to finish my spiel there. I think we've still got a few minutes left, Simon, so, so we can do some Q&A if that's helpful. Wonderful, Steve. Thought-provoking stuff. As always, thank you so much for that. And yes, I posted that website and the code in the chat box for anybody interested in that and um, we do have a few questions here and we have got a few minutes to do them um steve thank you very very much interesting from your observation what kind of personalities tend to choose trading as their full-time profession Well, I, think there, uh... with, I think it, it's different now to what it would have been maybe 20 years ago because the nature of trading is changing. So, you know, if you look, if we go back 15, 20, 25, or well, if you go back 30 years ago to the trading floor, the types of people that were coming into trading on the floor were very different now to if you went to a, an yeah. algorithmic hedge fund. So the scope of trading and the ways in which you can trade is so vast that actually you can you know it that there there is almost something for everybody um so you see a very wide spread of people on the trading floor now um 
and some people are you know very risk seeking and other people are quite risk averse so there's there's i say it's pretty diverse to be honest and i think um if you're super super wary and kind of very um cautious and you've got no tolerance for uncertainty then it's going to be a difficult environment no matter how you do that but the thing that we've seen with the risk compass is that there's a pretty much an equal spread um, distribution of traders across all of the nine different outcomes which shows us that it's not so much about your personality but it's about finding a way of trading that suits that personality which is which is more important right so yeah so don't try to change yourself don't try to create this new personality but find yeah i think you've got to start with kind of have, yeah have a sense of knowing yourself and your strengths and what you're good at and not so good at and you know and what your attitudes towards risk and, and this is a, this is really important because when you're um learning to trade quite often you're going to go on to a, a training course somewhere which should be taught by a person who's probably teaching a style that's worked for them um, but that person the style that works for them it doesn't mean it's going to work for all other people so um you need to start off by doing that by the way you need what we call a standardized approach early on but as you progress through your trading um a journey as such your learning pathway you need to be recognizing that as you go through that you're gonna have to start to become more aware about what seems to work for you or not so you can adapt the process to suit you as a person because um it won't work if you try to be somebody else's best self you've got to become your own best self find the approach that works for you make it work for you and it might be completely different to everybody else and it can be and you see this if you read market wizards they're all successful traders yeah. but they've all got their own unique approaches to doing it what i found incredible was when we went into lockdown um i'm based in spain so we went into lockdown very suddenly very quickly uh, before the uk so of course i was about 10 days ahead of most of my friends and family that i talked to in the uk the the, the way that we all dealt with lockdown. We were bombarded all of a sudden with this news that everything was infected and risks. As soon as we step outside the door, there was risk, and all sorts of people responded in different ways. Some are well, still are very, very fearful. Others just decided to get on with it. I think we're seeing this in the street parties in London. People, a lot of people saying, "Well, there's risk, but what can we do? Let's you know carry on with life." It's just incredible to see how people under adversity uh, respond sometimes yeah, in very and, different, different ways and and the people that did the risk compass uh, a company called pcl they've actually been doing some research they're doing it currently to look at how people have reacted during the uh, covid19 and they're mapping that against people's risk types and and there are people who are just naturally more cautious uh, mm. a bit more anxious more fearful um, by disposition that's just how they are and there's other people that are kind of a bit more gung-ho um, and actually, as a society of people, you need to have diversification because if we were, as a society, if we were all risk averse, there's no innovation. <laughs> no one takes any risk. No one goes out hunting. Um, but if everyone's gung ho, everyone goes out, you know, is crazy, goes out hunting, but no one comes back to actually survive. So you need, you know, you need this diversification of risk type as a society. Uh, we see that reflected actually in the markets, which is quite interesting. And um, as individuals, we just need to kind of have an indication about what that risk type is. Because, you know, if you're somebody who's very nervous and, and, and risk averse in trading, and I've got a trader who's one of the most successful traders I've ever worked with. Um, and he actually is relatively risk averse and quite cautious compared to other traders. But he just found a very successful way of, of, of working within the markets for himself. He's mastered it and he's phenomenal. Um, but he's completely different to another guy that I know who's probably equally successful who's much more kind of adventurous, gung-ho, you know, large size, smashing it around, both equally successful and yet polar opposite in personality. It's a bit, well, in my marriage, actually, take my wife as the comedian used to say, uh, she's she's the risk averse one uh, and I'm the much more risky one. And, and even though it leads to some conflict, shall we say sometimes, uh, it generally, it, it actually works to have two the, the two opposing points of view uh, as we go on. Well, that's, Sajal, the, um, that's, uh, the, that, that's the beauty, you know, if you look at trading teams or investment teams, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying mm -hmm. to basically, you know, plug each other in because your strengths will be your wife's weaknesses around risk and so on and vice versa. And as long as you can agree a common goal or a mission or a mandate, then you can, you yeah. can make it work. And you'll, you'll have the, um, 
you know, the conflict, the, the Rolling Stones called it creative abrasion, which I think is a great, a great phrase. So, <laughs> so you can you can have these heated discussions and smash a few guitars and drum kits and so on. But for them, the goal was making great music. So it was just a part of the process. They all wanted the same thing. They shared the common vision and goal. Um, but to get to it, they had to have some disagreements But because they were a group of different people. If they were all the same, it wouldn't have worked. So I'm gonna get her to give you a call and just tell her she's just just basically a compliance officer. That's 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 really her role. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michael says, uh, Steve, I find that mindful meditation and cycling in between trading sessions helps to clear the mind. Would you endorse these activities for other to others to improve their trading? The yeah, I mean the, the key thing is this is it's all we, we are all different. So there isn't a formula for for for. for you know, for, that we can share across all of us. What we've got to look at is the idea that what we want to be able to do is bring our best trading self to each moment we're in the market. That's the goal. And then what we've got to work out as individuals is how do I go about doing that? So how do I, you know, how do I prepare before I go into the markets? When I'm in the markets, what do I need to do to stay as close to my best trading self as possible? And how do I, what do I do post-market and post-trading to kind of recover and restore to bring my best self back the next day? So kind of pre, during and post. Now, if meditation and cycling works for a person, fantastic, you do it, but it doesn't mean it will work for all people. So really it's a, it's a bit like a here's, a, here's a menu of things that we know will work for people. And then from that menu, select the things that work down for you. For some people it's cycling, for someone else it might be a walk or a run, it could be a yoga session. For some it's meditation, for some it might just be sitting quietly with a cup of coffee for 10 minutes and reflecting. Uh, for mm. other people it might be some breath work. So, uh, but certainly meditation and physical activity are powerful um, ways to um, shift and maintain state during session, during the trading day. They're also both really powerful um, in terms of the benefits we get from doing those activities regularly over time on the brain. I like this question here from Sejal. It says, when you're in a positive trade, it usually happens that your mind starts calculating the profits which are not yet realized. And when the trade doesn't go that way, you are disappointed. It, is this touching on the idea of maybe thinking about points and pips as opposed to profit? Maybe that's... Well, the, the key thing, it's a great question because this can happen in a trade. So you can get, you know, your trade goes on side and immediately you start thinking, oh, great, it's gone on side. Um, it's going to my profit target and I'll have X amount of money. Um, but I've heard the same things from traders in January. They have, a, you know, that they start off their year, they have a good January and immediately they go, right, well, if I made X amount in January and I do that for the rest of the year, that'll be 12X. Oh, that'd be a really good year. <laughs> They're only in January. You've got 11 months to go yet. So the, 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 what the brain can do very quickly is it can start to forecast. Um, and what the challenge for us here in trading is that while we're forecasting, we're now creating an expectation. And as soon as you deviate away from that expectation, it increases the intensity of the reaction. So if, once, you, once you've got an idea about where you want to be, the mind draws a line between where you are and where you want to be. And any deviation away from that creates an emotional intensity. It could be positive if you're on track or negative if you're not. So the, the key thing here, this is where things like mindfulness or being able to have present moment awareness is so important because as soon as you catch yourself yeah. forecasting, oh, if when this trade goes to my profit target, I'll have X amount of money and that'll make my PL this. And, and as soon as you start doing that, you've got to catch yourself and press the pause button and go, right, I'm in the future here. But actually, what I've got to be focusing on is what's going on here on the screen in this moment. Take a very long, slow, deep breath with full attention. That'll pop you back into the moment. Ask yourself, what's important right now? That's the technique. Long, slow, deep breath, pop into the present moment, put the brakes on, ask yourself what matters in this moment. Refocus, go again. I've been listening to the 30 Minutes to the Moon podcast on BBC Sounds, season one and two, the story of Apollo 11 and 13. And the very final episode came out earlier this month. And there's some great words at the end of that. Um, not only from Kevin Fong, who sums up, uh, he, he likens the challenge that the NASA Mission Control had likened to uh, the, the NHS with the coronavirus, uh, but also they talked to the Mission Control leader and he talked about the, the best advice for younger people nowadays would be to just reduce the problem down to a series of steps, not mm -hmm. trying to solve everything 
overnight. This is what they did with the with the spacecraft. Just let's yeah. take it one step at a time. Lots of people, yeah. lots of brains together, and we'll just we'll get there. And I thought that was wonderful yeah. advice. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And for, Formula One have this nice phrase, which is focus on the next corner. Exactly. So, you know, the, the race might be 125 laps. You know, each lap might take you two minutes, or whatever. But all that really matters is the next corner. So that's your focus point. So you know, and if you get the next corner right, then the next corner, then the next corner, the next corner, and you do really? that for your two hours, then you have a great race. But if you start predicting your lap time for lap 57 when you're on lap three, you're not in the moment. You're not focused on the on the event. In trading, you're not in the market. You're in your own head, and we want to be focused in the moment with ourselves and the market. Wise words. Marguerite says herbal teas improve the mood uh, as well. So fantastic. Yep. Listen, I've, I've got carried away and already we're, we're up at four o'clock. Um, so, Steve, I'm going to have to uh, say thank you there and uh, it's been great to have you join us again. Uh, as always, a pleasure. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Good luck with the book. Uh, I hope the launch goes well. I hope everybody can pick up a copy from Herman House and uh, good luck. And I'll take the the presenter roll back from you now and say goodbye and thanks for everybody here. Thank you, Simon. Have a good day. There we go. Fantastic. Steve Ward, thank you very much. And Joe Neighbour, forgive me, I've run on over our start time. Um, it's absolutely got, fine. I'm quite happy to be there. listening to Steve, actually. <laughs> He's a uh, pretty universal, universal sort of uh, universally adored by the trade community. And well, we've just listened to, to the reasons why it does draw you in and you find yourself nodding and agreeing. And it's a it's a fascinating. I found myself on uh, Harriman House buying a copy of his book as well. Oh, great, great. They'll, they'll, they'll love seeing the code. The code. Yeah, I hope you use the code as I well. I will be using the code, okay. that's for sure, yeah. Joe, thank you for joining us. Lovely to see you. I know you